Mom and I are watching you. On the cloud, yes. Good. That sounded threatening. So let's see. So uh, anyway, so uh, welcome to this first session of the um, Center of World Christianity here at SOAS. Um, I'm extremely happy to have um, uh, a, um, a an, uh, an experienced speaker for, who's um, uh, a, a welcome guest at several centers, research centers, whether they're missionary, whether they are deal with Christianity, or whether they actually are uh, deal with um, the disciplines um, which um, uh, De Debbie deals with, um, which is always a very um, Welcome addition to uh, the uh, to a round of seminars, and this is of course our lunchtime seminar, for which we have uh, a number of other speakers over the year, uh, over the term. Sorry, um, uh, so um, uh, Debbie uh, will do the on, give us the honors of uh, actually starting this round. Um, the um, uh, intro in terms of introduction, if uh, Debbie needs any. Uh, uh, Professor Deborah De Gateskel uh, is originally from South Africa, so she knows the topic very well because this is the um, uh, wh where she studied as well. And uh, before she came here to SOAS in order to do her PhD, and this is of course where I know her from. So this is the um, uh, academic connection. Um, uh, has done a lot of work on uh, various aspects of. Um, uh, of Christianity and the modern history of South Africa. Um, and if you, if you have any questions concerning anything that goes beyond the, the remit, then I'm sure the, uh, that Debbie would also be able to uh, answer them. Um, but um, the structure of our uh, seminar is that we start off with a presentation, which is meant to last for about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, and then we will have a discussion afterwards. Um, it's, I know it's lunchtime, I know you will need to go to your various places, but um, I, I, have the, um, uh, I have two hours reserved on Zoom so we can, we can continue uh, the discussion afterwards. We can also switch off the uh, recording if, if, if this is what you uh, prefer in, during the discussion, but in the, um, uh, for the time being, I, I'm recording this so that we can um, uh, post it on the um, uh, on the YouTube link that we have for this uh, center. So uh, without wanting to uh, waste any more time, uh, I, have a, um, uh, I have the PowerPoint, which I'm going to share with you right now. And this is going to, um, it's going to take us to the, um, uh, this just means that I can't see any questions, but I can see uh, I, I can see the PowerPoint in any case. So, um, uh, De Deborah, uh, please um, uh, start, and uh, I'll be at your disposal whenever we need to change the sli slide. Right, lovely. Thank you, Lars. And in fact, you'll be able to pick up the chat because if you just press down below, the chat column is there. It should be. It's if it's full screen, then I can't see it. It's, oh well, I can see it. I can okay. see it at the bottom <laughs> below yeah. the below the thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Apologies for me not working out how to get on, folks. And I hope that if you're on speaker, you can actually see me. But uh, uh, I should think it will change, um, so that you don't just see Lars having his coffee. <laughs> oh, I can that... only see me. I can't only see you, Lars. I can't see. Can everybody see the um, the, the, the screen? The, uh, I have here. The, oh, you oh, can see yes. me, Joe says. Okay. Yes. If you yeah. change your view in the top right hand corner, if you change your view from speaker to side by side gallery, right, then you'll be able okay. to see everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Right. Okay. As you can see, what I'm wanting to talk about today and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm wanting to talk about two 1940s crises and a Christian response. So it's concerning the Christian Council of South Africa, the Second World War and the coming of apartheid. Because at two vital moments in the 1940s, the key decade of transition to apartheid, 
The Christian Council of South Africa, or CCSA, held large, significant ecumenical conferences. The 1942 wartime one was appropriately entitled Christian Reconstruction in South Africa. Can we have the first slide, please, Lars? So you will see the cover of that conference. I am. Um... I can see it here on one. Now, <laughs> yes. Perfect, okay. Uh, and you can see from that where it was held and who, who printed the, the program. While the second, the gathering called in 1949, a year after the National Party's victory under the slogan of apartheid, explored the Christian citizen in a multiracial society. And last, there's a slide of the second cover for the 1949 conference, the Christian citizen in a multiracial society. So you may already have picked up that the one conference happens in Lovedale in the Eastern Cape and the other at Rosettenville, which some of you may know is in Johannesburg. The CCC, the Christian Council of South Africa itself explicitly linked these two conferences in 1949, the year of the second one and it compared their timing and their contextual challenges. And this device was echoed by John de Grouchy in his important study of the church struggle in South Africa, where de Grouchy contrasts the optimistic air of 1942 with the much more apprehensive tone of 1949. So in comparing these two conferences, what I want to look at are four aspects where and why each of them happened, who came and what they discussed, how far African Christians contributed, and finally what the findings and impact of each conference were for South African society. Central to both conferences was the British Methodist minister, Edward William Grant, of whom we have a slide, Lars. E.W. Grant, as you can see, something of his CV there. E.W. Grant had come to Johannesburg way back in 1913. So in the 40s, he's already been in South Africa 30 years, which is important. He's a sort of experienced missionary among Africans. So he'd come to, to Joburg in 1913 as a, an ordained, a young ordained British Methodist uh, clergyman to, to work as a missionary among black miners and the urban African Christian elite in Johannesburg. And that's where I first encountered him when I did my PhD research on uh, the Johannesburg area. But as you'll see from the little CV, from 1932, when he relocated to the Eastern Cape, he equipped and trained indigenous evangelists in an interdenominational project at Lovedale Bible School, alongside the famous Scottish Educational Mission Institution, of which we have a slide now, Lars, showing you Lovedale. And then later, E.W. Grant headed Heald Town, the Methodist's nearby equivalent prestigious boarding school and teacher training institution from 1944. And this is where, of course, Mandela had been at secondary school, although he had, he had left by the time Grant got them. Mandela was there in the late 1930s. So despite Grant's pivotal role as the CCSA secretary for the first conference and chairman and then CCSA president during the second, he is virtually unknown and largely unremembered today. What appears deeply entrenched instead when we reflect on church and society in the 1940s and 50s is a focus on high profile individuals from just one denomination by means of the coverage of a handful of radical anti-apartheid white Anglican clerics, Michael Scott, Trevor Huddleston, Jeffrey Clayton, Ambrose Reeves, names that are much better, well, much better known. By contrast, I'm exploring whether indeed the 1942 Methodist-led ecumenical push for Christian reconstruction came to fruition earlier and on a more representatively national basis than better known Anglican efforts of the time. 
And then if we think about the end of the decade, perhaps it's just as noteworthy that in 1949, the CCSA gathering had already produced South Africa's first ecumenical theological statement against apartheid. Uh, and in that 1949 conference, they laid down some practical implications for political, social, and economic life of an alternative path of multiracial unity based on shared humanity under God. So I'm suggesting that analyzing these under-researched conferences and their still relatively unknown moving spirit provides a way of gauging and evaluating broader church and mission reaction to two overriding crises of the 1940s facing South Africa. It also makes it possible to probe the degree to which such ecumenism provided opportunities to mobilize African support and offer meaningful political challenge from the churches to the status quo in that vital decade. Now, what initially prompted a reevaluation of the first conference, the 1942 conference, was its almost total absence from Dubot and Jeeves' fascinating demonstration of the worlds of possibilities which were on offer in wartime South Africa. And Lars, we've got the cover of their important book uh, that came out over a decade ago. But what they show very interestingly is how South Africa in the 40s open, actually offers worlds of possibilities. So they're trying to say alongside the Africana nationalism, which was going to triumph in 1948, and the new kind of African nationalism that was being mobilized in the war years, uh, there was actually a liberal or social democratic South Africanism which was making a notable initial impact. It's creative ideas of social medicine. It's more generous forms of welfare support targeting the poorer black population. Frame the era as a short-lived radical moment in the history of social policy in South Africa. The whole way of thinking about South Africa's future. Now, of particular interest to me is that there's one chapter in this very good collection that looks at the church. So Rob Skinner, who's now at Bristol University, and I think was hoping to uh, sign in today, Rob Skinner analyzes two Christian perspectives offered by Bishop Clayton, the Bishop of Johannesburg, in an influential 1944 commission report on the church and the nation. So that's something coming out of the Anglican church. And Michael Scott, the sort of maverick uh, Anglican clergyman via the campaign for right and justice. So these, this is the focus of Skinner's chapter. So I was concerned that this input from prominent Johannesburg based Anglicans might give the false impression that the wider ecumenical Protestant mission community was not also caught up in the early 1940s liberal slash social democratic desire to imagine and create a better world post-war, uh, especially uh, coming from the Eastern Cape among the rurally based mission communities in the heartlands of some of the first African conversions to Christianity, an area also described as historically for Africans, the most politicized region of South Africa. So the Eastern Cape, if you look at the map in um, Elphick and Davenport's book on Christianity in South Africa, the Eastern Cape is absolutely studded with mission stations. And it's also a political heartland. Mandela, Susulu, uh, Mbeki, they all come from the Eastern Cape and from some of these mission institutions. But a central part of my initial argument is that Methodist missionaries from the Eastern Cape were vital in shaping 1940s ecumenism and church thinking about post-war reconstruction. So let's just think back to the, to the middle of 1941. June 1941 opened up a vital new phase in the Second World War with the German invasion of Russia, though Allied victory was still far from assured. That same month represented a pivotal moment 
for ecumenical cooperation in South Africa, with the future of church solidarity likewise uncertain, and yet with key Protestant leaders rapidly aiming to focus their energies on how Christians could rebuild society in the aftermath of the presumed victory of the Allies over fascism. So just a bit more about CCSA. The Christian Council of South Africa had been founded in 1936 alongside similar national ecumenical councils in that era across the Christian world. And it's these councils um, that are part of the building blocks of the later World Council of Churches. The CCSA was affiliated with the International Missionary Council, uh, whose papers I was able to, some of whose papers I was able to read at SOAS. So some of my material comes from um, IMC material in the SOAS archives. So CCSA ostensibly represented all Protestant churches and missions. You know, Catholicism is still very much a no-no at this point uh, among South African uh, Protestant Christians. Um, with de Grouchy explains, the English speaking churches and the Cape and Transvaal synods of the NGK or the Dutch Reformed Church, with the, the Cape and the Transvaal were the big players in the Dutch Reformed Church as founding members. But 1941 is crucial, not only in the war, as I've said, but in South African ecumenism because the DRC, the Dutch Reformed Church, finally withdrew and they set up their own church council, the Federated uh, Council of Dutch Reformed Churches. They finally withdrew from CCSA, claiming that it was biased towards the use of the English language and because they said they fundamentally differed with the other churches on the native question. In fact, William Nicoll of the DRC wrote frankly and crudely in the South African Outlook, the mission periodical, that it was for the Afrikaner leaders revolting to think they should use at ecumenical gatherings the same bathrooms and conveniences as to quote, even the most highly civilized native. So the Anglicans for a moment drew back as well, uh, only temporarily as it turned out, but they were thinking it was pointless to go on if the big players, if the Afrikaners were no longer involved. So only five years after it had been founded, it looked as though the whole short-lived ecumenical venture might go under. But at a representative council meeting, leading white Presbyterian and Methodist ministers urged the need for such a corporate body to make a common witness to Christian unity. Its work ought to go on. So I'm those are all quotes from the discussion in the South African Outlook, their journal, which is also a crucial source for me and which there are many copies at SOAS. Some of the crucial years uh, they don't have, but it, it's been a great source. So Presbyterians and Methodists are saying, we can't let this die. But what about the African Christians? The Interdenominational African Ministers Association also begged most earnestly that it continue. So in a unanimous epoch making decision, the council concluded that its continued existence was vital to the full Christian witness in South Africa, in South Africa and they even planned a momentous conference as they put it for 1942. Although the equally long serving American missionary, James Dexter Taylor seems to have played a pivotal role I'm arguing that Methodists were central to the council's survival and its new lease of life. The Anglican Archbishop, Derbyshire, later spoke of how E.W. Grant, as hardworking honorary secretary, had worked miracles and saved the council from collapse. No praise was too high for his contribution, is what Derbyshire later said. The council's office indeed was relocated to Lovedale where Grant was working in this Bible school. The first president after the split with the Afrikaners was also, also Methodist, Arthur Wellington, head or governor as they termed it, of the Methodist's main Eastern Cape institution, Healdtown, located a mere 10 miles away. So Healdtown is the Methodist equivalent of Lovedale and we've now got a picture of Wellington um, Arthur Wellington, 
So he was a, a very tall and commanding figure in charge of Healdtown, uh, inevitably nicknamed the Duke. And uh, he features in Mandela's reminiscences of Healdtown uh, to the advantage of Seth Mopatini, the black house master we discussed further below. But we also have four pictures of Healdtown just to give you a flavor of this institution on which I've also done research. Uh, a recent important book by Trevor Webster on Healdtown, uh, full of photographs and full of information on the alumni, which is, which is very good. But we can also see that uh, if we go on to the next three, that Healdtown trained uh, teachers. And so some of these men student teachers are not teenagers, they are in their 20s and are, um, this is a photo taken in 1955 when uh, the school was celebrating a centenary, its centenary. We've also got, I think the students, yeah, the Sunday morning church assembly, which would happen out of doors and was very impressive. And people would apparently, the whites would drive from Port Beaufort to join in the service and kind of see this huge mass of Christian pupils. And then I think we've got the church and the, um, and the, the high school buildings. So Healdtown, like Lovedale, was a, like a little village. Healdtown had about 55 buildings at the, at the end because there's a primary school for the pupils to practice in, a high school, um, a teacher training college, boarding houses, dormitories, the chapel, you know, a whole thing. So Wellington, the head of this important institution, which Grant was going to succeed him as the head of, Wellington becomes the head of the Christian Council. So Wellington and Grant are these two Methodist missionaries based at Healtown and Lovedale who are together organizing this, what they see as a sort of pioneering conference. So we're gonna now turn to Christian reconstruction in South Africa, the actual conference. In late 1941, aware of the gravity of the days ahead, said Grant, conscious that the winds of God were blowing and possessed by a spirit of adventure for the kingdom of God, uh, CCSA began planning a conference to consider the place and work of the church in the new world, which will emerge from the present conflict. So it was held just down the road from Lovedale at the South African Native College, later the University of Fort Hare. So you may be able to see, um, first of all, the location of the Eastern Cape uh, on the map of South Africa, and then towards the top in the middle of the, of the smaller map, more detailed map, you can see Alice, um, uh, which is where the, the university was. And Fort Beaufort, just to the west of that, is where Healtown was. So all these things are cheek by jowl. But we also have uh, some, yeah, thanks, thanks, Lars, thanks. I don't know how to do that. Um, and then we've got, I think, four, four slides of Fort Hare. So this is uh, Alice in the Eastern Cape in the sort of present day. Uh, and then we've got uh, some more slides of, of the venerable old buildings, uh, which is where they held the conference. I think there's one more of the students. Yeah, Fort Hare students. So the premier, I mean, the only <laughs> black university in South Africa in those years um, with a huge missionary involvement in its founding. So a very important pivotal place to hold this conference. So um, just to remind ourselves what we're talking about, we're gonna go back. The next slide is of the cover again, the, the Christian reconstruction in South Africa. And what we have next is the actual topics of for 1942. And I'll just talk you through it. Um, if Lars can show us the, the next slide. Okay. So in terms of the program for the packed three days, uh, they were arguing that action as Christians had to spring from steadfast faith. So they would first consider what they believed about God and what characterized the redeemed individual as well as a redeemed or transformed society. So these three topics were handled respectively by the Anglican Archbishop, a Methodist minister and Senator Edgar Brooks, a very interesting Christian uh, 
uh, educationist originally from Natal, who was one of the so-called native representatives in parliament. Then Christian teaching in relation to the South African social order would be explored via addresses from urban social worker, Miriam Janish, who, she worked in the Joburg City Council on the family and Reverend Seth Mokatimi, who's the man I've done some more research on, on race relations. So Seth, the um, uh, boarding uh, house master, and he's a, an ordained Methodist minister, but Seth was the boarding house master and then the chaplain at um, Heeltown for about 15 years. And he's the only black who was asked to give a plenary talk um, but he's working at Heeltown under Wellington, under the Duke. So, um, and, and Wellington kind of mentored Seth Mokatimi, as Mokatimi himself says, um, very sort of energetically and lovingly, um, uh, Wellington was kind of urging Seth on to um, kind of be a voice within the Methodist church. For the econ this, uh, discussion of uh, church teaching in relation to the South African economic order, ironically, Professor Murray of Cape Town, of whom there's more to say, but I won't say it now, was going to address uh, inequality of wealth and possessions, while the Fort Hare principal, Professor Alexander Kerr, would tackle inequality of economic opportunity. Professor H.P. Cruz, so lots of professors, <laughs> Uh, would answer the question, what form of Christian order is possible for a South African nation? While Reverend R.H.W. Shepherd, a well-known figure in um, uh, South African church life, from Lovedale, who was the editor of this missionary magazine, the, the editor of the South Af African Outlook, he would offer a closing interpretation and summary of the results and findings of the conference. Um, as the purpose of the gathering, uh, the, the organizers said was not merely academic discussion, but the building up of a practical fellowship of faith and service. But they saw this conference as a sort of educational opportunity as well. So in advance of the conference, which was quite short, it was only three days long, 120 different groups across the country, often interdenominational, but I don't know how interracial they were, I suspect not, um, discussed these uh, different topics set out in eight pamphlets. So there's a lot of printed stuff produced, and no doubt by the Lovedale Printing Press. So this is all to sort of raise interest and get people talking. By a month beforehand, numbers wanting to attend were far in excess of those that could be accommodated. Some 200 leaders in the religious life of the land from 40 churches and organizations, they said, were expected. Uh, in the end, 135 people actually came. The delegates were accredited representatives of the various churches and missionary societies belonging to the council, plus others specially nominated by them or selected for their special knowledge and experience. And we've got a list last of the, um, those who came in 1942. Um, you may want to just run your eye down them and you'll see it's a, it, it represents what was in a way a strength, but also a dilemma for the Christian council that the, <laughs> there had been a very successful strong body that Rick Elphick draws on the records of very well for his brilliant book on the equality of believers. The, there had been a general missionary conference of South Africa, which had regular uh, conferences and produced eight volumes of different people's talks. I mean, this is the sort of model that I think Grant is following. Uh, but the GMC, the General Missionary Conference, was missionary bodies only. It was people working among Africans. Whereas what you have here is a mixture of churches and missions. And you've also got some extra bodies like at the top of the second list, Johannesburg Municipal Native Affairs Department because Miriam Janish, who was the social worker lady was one of the speakers. And you've got Toc H, the um, just fourth from the end, um, which was a kind of charitable, well-meaning organization that came out of 
the war, the First World War, you've got the Army Educational Services as the fifth thing down. So you've got quite a mixture of different bodies that were represented. What about their findings? The lengthy findings and resolutions issued afterwards began by affirming that CCSA's belief in the sovereignty of God and lordship of Christ was the sanction for the supreme value that they attached to human personality, and it was the ground of our concern for social reconstruction. So they're saying we believe in God and that's why we want social reconstruction. And they also enjoined mutual respect and service with claims of superiority or accusations of inferiority being declared as contrary to the mind of Christ. So they're saying there's no room for discrimination. But you might think it sounds a bit paternalistic. They also said whites should bear in mind as trustees that the ward is coming of age and then trusteeship must become partnership. Uh, if we think back to Dubot and Jeeves and the worlds of possibilities, the council aligned itself most with the trends that Jeeves and Dubot analyze in arguing that it was incumbent upon all Christian people to work for the establishment of social security for all and the removal of distress and poverty, while recognizing this would mean very heavy sacrifices by the more privileged. The state should ensure fair work opportunities for all, together with a living wage, adequate housing, and national health services. So that's interesting. I mean, that picks up on the Dubot and Jeeves that there are these very ambitious ideas, which I gather Shula Marx has said, then get kind of annexed by the, by the British for the beginnings of the National Health Service, that the ideas on social medicine knocking around in early 1940s South Africa um, are very advanced. Um, uh, so they're saying, the, the, the Christian, these Protestant Christians are saying there should be adequate housing and national health services. They also advocated primary schooling for all because the situation in South Africa, of course, that was that whites were meant to go to school, but uh, blacks uh, had no obligation and no provision for universal primary education. The, the schooling that is going on is by and large being done by the missions. Um, and so this conference is saying all kids should at least get to primary school and uh, they wanted a more scientific system to fund native education because native education is very poorly financed and it's a bit hit and miss. So what particularly interested me was what did the African speakers contribute in 1942? So although Seth Mokatimi, the, the heel town housemaster of the Mandela anecdote, was the sole black plenary speaker of the eight officially nominated speakers. Locating the conference in an African mission and educational heartland paid off in the relatively high and high profile black participation overall. Africans con constituted over one fifth of the total attending 29 out of 135 to go by their surnames listed. And I, that's what comes next. I've got um, a list uh, and I simply went through the list and picked out the African surname. So this is a, a slightly flawed uh, approach, but it was just fascinating to see, you know, unfortunately I don't have the equivalent for 1949. They didn't do this in 1949, but a third of the Africans came from Eastern Cape educational institutions. You can see Fort Hare, Lovedale, the Fort Hare, Benson Vale's the big Methodist one, Heald Town, uh, okay. Um, lost my place. <laughs> mm -hmm. A third came from Eastern Cape Educational Institutions and a third from the Pretoria Witwatersrand Vereniging area, the so-called PWV. So you've got people there from Pretoria, Orlando, which is part of the beginnings of Soweto, Johannesburg, Everton, which is down near the Vaal River, Joburg, Joburg, Orlando, again, the, you know, um, uh, Soweto. Uh, these African attenders included 15 ordained ministers, which you can see, 
eight graduates, although only three of them were among the clergy, which is interesting, and two black women. Um, and you'll see the name of Miss M. Soga of um, uh, Queenstown. Nina Soga had been at Tambaram, the 1938 International Missionary Council meeting in India, which spoke of the younger and the older churches to try to get away from outdated missionary language. And, you know, it's fascinating to see which Africans from South Africa and indeed from Southern Rhodesia went to Tambaram. So for uh, Stan Lake Sam Kangi, whom Terry Ranger wrote a biography of, going to Tambaram was absolutely pivotal. I yeah, I think he even named his house after it. The, uh, for, for the African Christians to meet the Indian Christians and the Chinese Christians was absolutely um, mind blowing. And, uh, you know, someone like um, Albert Latuli also spoke very warmly of his experiences at Tambaram. Um, because the conference met at Fort Hare, two notable academics of the staff, Professor DDT Jabavu and ZK Matthews uh, also attended and we've got uh, rather nice pictures of them there. Apart from Mokotimi, three other Africans opened the discussion on a particular topic. So even if they weren't plenary speakers, they um, got to talk after the plenary speaker. So Reverend GB Molefi, for instance, spoke briefly after Senator Brooks, and said Africans wanted to share in reconstruction, but they were insecure, they were forced into submission politically. Furthermore, he said racial division in the church bred a type of nationalism, which weakened the spiritual structure. And then in a piquant change of program, because Professor Murray had been unable to come from Cape Town after all, J.M. and Klapo, who was a politically active educationalist, ended up giving the main address on in inequalities of wealth and possessions, while Kerr from Fort Hare was followed by Reverend Zedar Mahabani, long involved in the African National Congress as well. Both Nklapo and Mahabani come across as sharper in their critique and more focused in their demands than Mokadimi. His was a classic, almost lofty portrayal of the need for interracial harmony and the potential for black-white cooperation under maturing trusteeship. While they, uh, Nflapo and Mahabani, were much more concrete and urgent in their assertions of what exactly needed reconstruction. So uh, we've got a picture of Seth um, Mokotimi in his plenary on race relations, nevertheless unequivocally denounced segregation as following on from anxiety about white self-preservation, a black peril mentality born out of fear and an unjustified sense of intrinsic superiority, he said. Segregation, Mokatini said, was unchristian. You cannot love where you fear, and love is the only way of life. Instead, he said, Africans have demonstrated their common loyalty to South Africa through their support of the war, and surely that, together with our interdependence, our common humanity, demand of us to live and work together, and together evolve a humane formula for interracial goodwill. Politically, he called for the qualified franchise, which Cape Africans still had, to be extended to the other three provinces. He also called for Africans to be represented by their own race. You had the strange thing that had been put together in 1936, where there were four white so-called native representatives. So he says, can we please have some of our own people representing us? And he called for direct representation in urban councils. He also wanted more interracial personal friendships. And so he picks up on a biblical allusion. He says, like the Macedonians whom St. Paul saw in a vision crying out for help, non-European said Mokotini were crying out, out, help us feel we are men and fellow citizens with you. But there was tougher sounding talk from the more skeptical in Flapo, and we'll have a picture of him next. Um, the acute distress of many needed immediate Christian action. And for those of you who know the end of St. Matthew's gospel, that's coming through in what in Flapo says. 
The problem of inequality of wealth and possessions is too urgent and its implications are too far reaching to be made a subject for mere speeches and ideals that do nothing to feed hungry mouths or to close, clothe those bodies that are at this moment covered by unsightly rags or shivering with cold against which they have but scanty covering. Without abandoning the doctrine of otherworldliness, the church should instill into the hearts of the people some measure of love for this world, which after all is the work of God and home of his children, which they should not treat as an evil place where they need not build a lasting economic fabric. And uh, Nklapo concluded by quoting the 1938 IMC Tambaram report on the oneness of mankind and the need to look on all people without prejudice or discrimination. Zedar Mahabani had a compact list of urgent injustices to be redressed, citing instances of inequality which pressed heavily upon the African people, the glaring disparity in land distribution, the lack of openings in well-paid jobs such as the public service, limited educational facilities and commercial opportunities. And so he summed up such unjust conditions resulted in extreme poverty leading to moral degeneracy of womanhood. I don't like the sound of that so much the depravity of youth and malnutrition. The duty of the church in the light of Christian teaching was clear. The times called for a return to New Testament standards. Reconstruction must involve recognition of the African share in the common heritage of humanity, removal of all color bar legislation, reconsideration of the country's land and educational policies, and the obligation of raising the standard of living of all races and colors. This was a far reaching challenge to the church to be the church in reality and across all of national life. And this was a challenge which one of the white delegates, Alan Payton, considered to have been unmet. I'm running out of time, so we're just gonna skim through Alan Payton because um, the author of Cry the Beloved Country was there. And afterwards, if we move on to the next slide, he, he felt that the conference had been, if you could, dip down to the end, the conference had been too short, too full of set speeches, too hurried to permit of real discussion. Its resolution suffered on this account. But he also said um, that it didn't speak in words of living fire of our duty towards society or towards God. And so at the end of the second paragraph, he says, one African speaker declared that the church might well pack up if it did not commence to practice towards the African the brotherly duty that it preached. This sad note was sounded all too often. Its truth was profound, an urging of Christians to do what they could not be. It was the black church telling the white church what a church should be, which was a very powerful piece. Um, the next slide shows, reminds us that a couple of years late, well, six years later, he published Cry the Beloved Country. Um, but if we move on, he went on in 1953 to help found the South African Liberal Party, which took a more radical political stand than the 1940s CCSA. And it, it was clear from his one volume of his autobiography, Towards the Mountain, that he had been far more influenced by being involved in Geoffrey Clayton, the Archbishop, the Bishop of Dobo, Geoffrey Clayton's diocesan commission on the church and the nation and on which he commented pithily, it did not change the nation, but it changed me. And he then went on to try and apply its principles in the South African Liberal Party. The point being that um, the Liberal Party came to support one man, one vote, whereas in the forties, CCSA, with difficulty is kind of moving, as we'll see when we look at the 1949 conference, the CCSA was moving towards um, uh, a qualified franchise, but it wasn't saying one man, one vote. There's more to say about the impact of the 1942 conference, but I'm just going to pick up on the fact that uh, the idea, the hope, was that the church would have an impact on government policy. Uh, CCSA wanted the church to speak out boldly, to be a conscience to the nation, the leaven of democracy, 
not to be content with denouncing the evils it sees, but to be constructive and positive about what should be done to put them right. Society must be rebuilt. So we'll have a picture of Jan Smuts, the prime minister of the wartime prime minister of South Africa. So eight men from the Christian Council go in January 1943 in the wake of this conference on a deputation to see the prime minister. And they have three key wishes. They're worried about African malnutrition. They want better parliamentary representation for Africans. And they want the trade unions recognized, the African trade unions. So Smuts, who is, you know, has a reputation for being wily or in Afrikaans, slim yani, you know, he's a, he's a bit clever. Smuts assured them, your advice will always be welcomed by me and attended to by the government. Justice must be done to the underdog. Uh, but he was disappointingly non-committal despite his very full answers. So one author has commentated, commented, Smuts parried their requests, trying to assure the Christian council that he shared their ideals, even if the time was not right for action. But in fact, the council is so grateful, they're deeply indebted to him for seeing them. They're profoundly grateful for the assurance of the government's goodwill. Let's move on briefly to the Christian citizen in a multiracial society, because this is the, the second conference. Uh, E.W. Grant found himself back in the saddle as the president by the end of the 1940s. Uh, Wellington had died, Archbishop Derbyshire had died. Um, but in 1948, the National Party came to power on the slogan of apartheid, and uh, they, the, the CCSA responded in a pamphlet. Um, uh, the church's judgment on apartheid, uh, condemning the policy as contrary to the universal dignity of all. So the, the Christian council sends um, uh, a copy of this pamphlet to the prime minister, to Milan, whose picture you saw briefly a moment ago, um, and asked him to receive a deputation, just as Smuts had received a deputation. Uh, the heads of the Anglican church, the Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists. But Milan gives them the brush off. He says that their views are extremely one-sided and exaggerated. Apart from their present political intent, they obviously stigmatized the existing as well as the traditional policy of the country as unjust, anti-Christian, and immoral. He disagreed with their interpretation of scripture. Uh, he thought they just wanted a chance to lodge a protest. So no, they could not come. Um, so the, the sort of contrasting reactions is of interest. So then they go ahead and organize the conference, Christian Citizen in a Multiracial Society. Again, they're meeting in a church institution. So you've got some uh, pictures of the, this urban setting. So they're up on the, on the Rand. They're in Johannesburg. Rosettenville is a southern, in the southern suburbs of Joburg. That's a more contemporary picture of it. Um, and the buildings they were, so you can see where it is, um, the, the little pin dot um, where, where um, Rosettenville is today. Uh, and about 100 people went. As I say, unfortunately, we don't know um, how many of them were African. I, I'm going to still keep looking. Um, and 25 church bodies were represented. But we've got a couple more pictures of where they met. Um, they met in Anglican buildings. There, there's a whole, there was a whole complex in Rosettenville where the community of the resurrection, the Anglican order that Trevor Huddleston belonged to, uh, did theological training. They ran a very elite boys school. Well, in fact, it had girls in it as well. St. Peter's School, um, the girls had been incorporated back in the 1920s. Um, uh, all of this fell away after um, Bantu education, but these are the buildings that they would have met in that are now sort of a retreat center and so on. Um, the interesting thing is that the affirmations of this 1949 conference went much further politically and were much more explicit about the potential shared citizenship of Africans. 
than uh, had been the case earlier. Um, they proceeded from the spiritual to the social, but there was no separate talk on race relations. I think we've got a list of the talks, Lars, um, which should come up. Yeah. Uh, there was no separate talk on race relations because the first three substantial papers were all really tackling apartheid and offering theological, anthropological, and historical perspectives on why separation was not the Christian option. The second half of the proceedings looked at politics, education, and the economy. So uh, we can see from their affirmations, which is the next slide, what, uh, oh, sorry, that's, that's who belonged, but the affirmations show you that uh, they were trying to affirm God made everybody, there's an essential unity, um, so they still have a kind of evolutionary approach. Individuals who have progressed from a primitive social structure to one more advanced should share in the responsibilities and rights of their new status. They're trying to say, we need unity, not separateness, not apartheid. We need Iendrach, the Afrikaans for what they were calling unity through teamwork. If you're a citizen, you should participate in government, um, the French, but, but they're saying the franchise should be accorded to all capable of exercising it. So they're saying there's got to be a qualified franchise. Um, they want every child to have the chance of receiving the best possible education. This is at a time when the ideas of what becomes Bantu education are swirling around um, and everyone should be free to work where they can make, best of the, make the best of their abilities. Again, the conference meant people living and thinking and praying together from various national traditions and home languages, but knit together in the fellowship of the kingdom, which is not of this world, said the organizers. They believed that the experience of all in South Africa, uh, that mutual respect and frank exchange of views, unfettered fellowship, brotherly love can prove stronger than the forces of mistrust, isolation, and fear which infect the life of our nation. So what interested me once again is what input did, comes from the African speakers. Uh, again, they're important. They give two of the key presentations on politics and education, neither of which was explicitly tackled in 1942. So you can see uh, that Albert Lutuli uh, makes these very potent points about how the different options, assimilation, segregation, trusteeship, were being kiboshed, were being prejudiced by whites claiming to exclusively own South Africa, by whites spirit of domination and superiority, by whites not being prepared to think about full citizenship rights, by whites discounting cooperation, and this is important, they were thus provoking black non-cooperation, and non-recognition of individual black attainment. In other words, if Africans have, if Africans have advanced, they're not getting recognition for it. Um, uh, and Klapo was also there and also spoke, and he, as an educationist, was particularly scathing about this education committee commission that was going to come up with Bantu education. He says, um, for Africans, Christian national education smacked of racialism, subnational isolationism, very concerned about mother tongue education. They feel um, that if they don't learn English, they're not being helped in a multiracial society and a, and a, a global world, polyglot world. He's also furious about the fact that this Commission on Native Education, which is going to bring in huge changes to African education, has no African on it. You know, he says this crucial government commission on native education should have had an African on it. So there is an input, which is what I was interested in. Let me try and briefly uh, draw things to a close, comparing the two conferences. Um, how political or confrontational was CCSA in the 1940s? I've argued that the two conferences, and we can see they, they uh, try and have dealings with two different prime ministers. The two conferences 
took place under different political regimes and that shows in their proceedings and outcome. Um, at both conferences, although Africans were in a minority, their participation was greater than in the earlier years of the council under DRC leadership, not surprisingly that they're, they're more to the fore. Some of the plenary speakers like Mahabani and Tharpo and Lutuli were actually also deeply involved with the ANC alongside their ecumenical ties. There are certain themes that kept their urgency throughout the 1940s, African poverty, low wages, family life, migrant labor, um, although uh, economic analysis became more searching and hard hitting. Um, we've talked about the anxiety about Christian national education and the attitudes to the franchise. What I haven't brought out yet is how strongly uh, in 1949, the white missionaries are nevertheless saying that although Africans must be true citizens alongside us, they uh, jib at any interracial intimacy. Okay, so Henri Philippe Junot, the son of the famous missionary, insisted that cooperation did not mean miscegenation or ignoring white interests, or it did not mean progressive white annihilation. And, and Leslie Hewson, the Methodist minister, argued there was a real consensus of opinion against miscegenation. He advocated co-worship, co-education, collaboration, co-citizenship, but not cohabitation. So, you know, it seems to me the white leaders at the end of the 40s knew that it would be impossible to win wide support for social integration and interracial sexual relations from their white congregations. And in fact, of course, 1949, um, the Immorality Act is passed, and in 1950, the Mixed Marriages Act is passed, unless I've gotten the right way, the wrong way around. But the point is 1949 and 1950. The apartheid government is explicitly saying you can't have sex or marriage between white and black. And this um, uh, council, for, that, for them, it's a step too far to go against all of that. They're also not clear quite on what is legitimate white opposition. So, you know, one leading uh, Christian, white Christian minister says, a policy of apartheid, which denies to anyone the opportunity of cooperation in the life and service of the community is unchristian, and a policy of non-cooperation and hostility is equally unchristian. So that's tricky when the, Nash, when the African National Congress is just deciding, actually, we've got to go for non-cooperation. Um, they're not saying violence, not till the 1960s, but they're saying, we, you know, by 1952, they're having a defiance campaign. Grant himself seemed to go further. He said it might even be a Christian duty to oppose the declared policy of the state. Opposition might have to be quite uncompromising. We have no right not to speak. So um, there's no time really to talk about the decade to come, but uh, there's lots more I could say about the sort of dilemmas for the church of the 1950s, but I think I need to draw things to a close. Let me just read my <laughs> concluding paragraph. Whatever ambiguities and vacillations the 1950s would bring, the historical record suggests that we need to appraise ecumenical relations in the 1940s afresh with Edward Grant's input a particularly relevant key. Missionaries like him who worked with African church members and leaders into the 1940s, I mean, he spent his whole life in South Africa, he didn't come back to England till 1955. They were becoming rarer, but they had something distinctive to offer. Through reviving or fostering new interest in CCSA, through study groups and leaflets to raise awareness and provoke wider discussion, they were trying to revive personal religion, and provoke social conscientization across the broad range of Protestantism with a view to building a united multiracial Christian witness that would make an active difference in redressing social, economic, and political inequalities in South Africa. Their strengths and weaknesses deserve to be incorporated more fully into our understanding of that decade. 
The 1940s were beset by crisis, sure, but they were also seemingly so full of possibilities and opportunities for change. Hope, they hoped they would result in a greater Christian impact on South African society with a view to its transformation under God. Sorry, we started late and I've ended late. <laughs> That's, uh, okay, I'm going to click off so that we can actually see you. Um, and that's, um, I, I, th I think we're all seeing you at the moment. It's, um, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for, for this very, very interesting talk, which um, I mean, to myself, um, I, I always, um, uh, looked at South Africa from the outsider's perspective as part of the wider world. And at some point you mentioned the, um, uh, the, the, the fact that the black congregations were meeting um, uh, uh, Indian and Chinese students and, uh, or uh, Christians. And, and that was something that uh, I found very um, interesting, especially in the Indian case. Uh, do we know anything about their contacts with the um, movement that would uh, eventually be supported and carried by uh, Mahatma Gandhi? Because he was not Christian, of course, but he was, uh, he was very much at home in South Africa. Uh, was he somehow, uh, did he have an opinion on this? Or do we know anything about uh, possible contacts between his, his, his movement, his own personal engagement and, and the uh, CCSA? Well, there's a lot to say there. What I was talking about, the, the black, what I was talking about in ref, reference to the excitement of meeting Indian and Chinese Christians, that's when they go to an international conference. Mm -hmm. That's when they go to India. To I think Tambaram is near Chennai, near Madras. Mm -hmm. So although there are Indian Christians in South Africa, uh, quite Possibly, I mean, the Indian Christian community is very small and a lot of it develops quite late. So I don't even know if there are Indian reps at these conferences. You know, there's mm -hmm. certainly Anglican missions among Indians. Um, but as I say, the, the Indian Christian presence in South Africa grows a lot much later and it's largely confined to Natal. The, oh. um, the Indians and sort of Malays in the Cape are Muslim mm -hmm. and the Indians who came to Natal to work on the sugar plantations are um, mostly Hindu but then there are Muslim passenger Indians who were richer Indians who came afterwards. So the, the, the um, indentured labor is Hindu, the, Passenger Indians come and set up business and um, import rice to uh, sell. And, and so there are quite prosperous Muslim Indian businessmen in Natal. And there's quite a lot of hostility between the whites okay. and even the Africans for rich Indians in Natal. So these uh, some Africans and some whites go to Tambaram and they meet the Indian and Christian Chinese Christian leaders who are a little bit more advanced in their passage through church leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think by then, maybe Azariah has already become a bishop, you know, that the people uh, uh, that Africa, that Christians in China and India are much further down the road of the devolution of power. But they that but they are eloquent and they impress the Africans. Contacts with Gandhi in Natal have been much researched. It's not my particular field, but it's terribly, terribly interesting because mm -hmm. Gandhi is okay. He's in South Africa for twenty years, so there is some discussion about do Gandhi's ideas of uh, passive resistance influence Af the ANC. Um, uh, when they do um, uh, when they do the defiance campaign, um, which is meant to be sort of nonviolent resistance, and there are in the, the ANC is working in collaboration. The ANC is still an African only organization in the 1950s when it does the defiance campaign, but it's working with the South African Indian Congress, which includes some communists, but. Um, there, there are, there's Indian input into 
the idea of passive resi of, of the nonviolent resistance of the defiance campaign. There, um, I don't, I haven't personally been to this area, but just outside Peter Maritzburg, you have this fascinating um, uh, node of of Christian and um, uh, white Christian and black Christian and Gandhian interaction because there are there's a big um, Methodist uh, African settlement which is. If I'm, am I getting this right, Joe? It's Edendale, I think, Edenvale, Edendale, Edenvale is in Joburg, Edendale. Um, and then Phoenix is the Gandhian settlement where his printing press is and where he had his sort of ashram. And um, yeah, I think John Dubé's school, Ochlanga, which is a sort of pioneering independent African school, I think Ochlanga is also near there. Um, so, you know, I'm sure pe people have researched all of this, but I don't personally know a huge amount about Dubé and Gandhi and the Christian uh, um, Hindu interaction, but it's very much on uh, happening on the ground and and on the research agenda. So, but but what? in the 1940s, what contact African Christians in South Africa had had with Indian Christians in South Africa. I don't really know. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yes, but, but that was, um, you know, uh, part of uh, a very uh, interesting uh, puzzle of information, which uh, uh, which is, uh, in fact, uh, th th this is um, not just world Christianity, it's actually world history, which is, uh, which is being created. Uh, against the background of, of decolonization, of course, um, and before uh, the, the Cold War really sets in. Uh, so it's uh, extremely interesting. Um, any other questions? P people from the background, I can see you here in a, in a strip on top. <laughs> if anybody would write, like to raise their hands uh, electronically, you can also write into the little chat function. Is that Jesse Mugambi in Kenya? <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's 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 me. Um, I met you in Pretoria twenty years ago. Well, the world uh, is getting smaller. Yes. <laughs> uh, now we can we can meet without having to seek for a visa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, just to thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Um, Kenya was a crown colony. And that meant that it was administered directly from, from London. And the separation of the races here was very much more strict than it was in, in South Africa. There was a regulation of movement uh, from the native reserves to the settlers, uh, to the settlements, so that the best of the land which the Europeans chose for themselves. Uh, an African would be there only if he was going to be a liberal. Otherwise, they would be trespassing. Well, that's all like happens in South Africa. Exactly. But it was worse <laughs> here, much worse, uh, because it had all the blessings of the Imperial Majesty. <laughs> 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 and um, uh, in my, my childhood, um, uh, going to school and uh, singing the national anthem of the United Kingdom um, uh, is, is quite an experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, we had it. We had it uh, growing up in Cape Town. I also sang and, the national anthem. And, and some, then, of, some of us would curse as we sang it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we had the added problem that yes. then the Afrikaner nationalists brought in an alternative national anthem. And so I was 12 and with my friends, we were trying to be rebels. And so when we had to sing de stem, which means the mm. voice, um, we were trying to sing God save the queen. I don't yeah. think this was a very meaningful protest. Yeah, but, but turning. But, but Jesse, what about um, the Christian council in Kenya? Um, 
and its yes. fortunes. Yeah, the Christian Council was, uh, was a very, very useful instrument uh, during those days because it brought together leaders of the various denominations, uh, which of course had been um, separated from already from, from Europe and North America. But the Christian Council was a, was a very useful instrument and became a mediatory instrument uh, during the, the transition. Right. One of the aspects that is not very much talked about, uh, of which um, my life is an integral part, <laughs> what I call the lost decade. Right. The lost decade for Kenya was 1952 to 1962. Right. That decade is when the state of emergency was right. declared. And uh, the Kenyans of African descent had to be put into concentration camps. Nobody uses that word, but I have been to Germany <laughs> and have seen those which are called concentration camps. And uh, I spent part of my childhood in one of those. My goodness. <laughs> Right. So was your whole because, family put in? Because the people, had, the, the people had to be removed from their they, they, they had lived traditionally. So were you supposedly in a protected village? There were so-called protected villages, yes. But uh, protected meant that uh, there, there would be a moat uh, or that you could not jump across. Goodness. With spikes in, in between, with a dawn, dusk to dawn curfew. <laughs> and you'd have, and you you'd get out of uh, those camps uh, at your own peril. So were you being educated while this was going on? Well, uh, I I happened to have started school in 1954. Right. And that was uh, in in the heat of the state of emergency. Right. It happened that my parents were Christian. They were they were Anglican. And. Because of that, they took refuge into one of those uh, camps, which was right. also a military base. Right. And you can imagine um, uh, being in a mission station of the Church of the, of the Church of England, the CMS, where uh, the missionary was a pilot of the Air Force of the British Air Force. <laughs> 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 he and, wasn't uh, actually working as a pilot, was he? Still? Well, well he was a former all pilot. We know, all we know is that uh, the, the, the dumb bastards uh, uh, dropped bombs in, in, uh, in our neighborhood. So <laughs> how would I know? <laughs> I, I wouldn't know. But I was very keenly interested. But, but maybe uh, I might share this. I haven't sh sh shared it out. Um, uh, outside before before this, but I think I should I should say it. A question was asked by Jonathan Bonk, um, he, the founder of the DSEB, Dictionary of African yes. Christian Biography, and I was asked, when did you become? When do you think you became really theologically conscious? And it was Christmas uh, Christmas Eve, nineteen uh, fifty five. I was in standard two and the missionary in residence, Michael Page, uh, made some tents uh, to uh, uh, entertain the children. I was in standard two and he told us that Father Christmas, I pronounce it as he told us because he didn't know English at that time, Father Christmas and he, he told us Father Christmas was coming. And I asked him in, in our own language, local language, and, and who is Father Christmas? He said, well, when he comes, you know. And where will he come from? Well, you will know when he comes back. And then so he said, you get into the tent and uh, then Father Christmas will come. I was the only one who sneaked out and I actually saw him go to the back of the tent. I saw him changing. <laughs> I saw him changing. And then he came and told us he was Father Christmas. A and moment I felt, of uh, I felt hypocrisy. Really <laughs> a moment of um, misleading you. <laughs> and I concluded that missionaries were liars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very difficult to get out of it. 
because it's a, it was a good ceremony, but it was completely out of context. And uh, a lot of that happened, but just to get back to the, to the issue of religion and, and change, uh, the missionary denominations that came were multifarious. Kenya had, and still has, very, very many denominations, American, German, Dutch, everybody. At the same time, the independent churches were numerous and they still remain so. So Kenya is a very uh, diversified, had a, has a very diversified religious, religious background. And the question you asked about the role of the Christian council was crucial because it helped to, to be a, 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 a basis, a, a forum, an umbrella through which uh, constructive criticism of the imperial government could, mm, be, could mm, be done. Mm. And it, it continued to serve that role at, after independence. So when we think about uh, the transition of Kenya from colonial rule to sovereignty, the National Council of Churches of Kenya was, was instrumental. Um, I would also like to say that in general, religion uh, in Kenya uh, did and continues to play a very crucial role in uh, moderating and uh, constructively changing our, our society. I am part of that process, so I could talk about this the whole day. And, and so uh, I just want to thank you very much because as you talked, I, I could recall and I could place myself <laughs> into, um, into the, the narrative that you, you are making. Mm. Let me make one final point about, um, about the, the, the secular aspect. Kenyans were conscripted to the First World War. My, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather was one of the conscripts. He is fortunate, he survived. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and so he is one of my mentors. Uh, he became a blacksmith and was uh, extracting iron from uh, alluvial sand and uh, making uh, tools. Uh, and uh, so I know him as a blacksmith who could actually make, uh, make, make metal from sun. My father was con conscripted to the Second World War and was sent to Burma and India. He was fortunate to survive and I was born after, after he came back. And he was a staunch Christian, but you can imagine uh, in a personality like mine, the kind of background that one has come, or had one has come, come from. All I can see is that God has, has been gracious that some of us have to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I think what you have to say about the importance of independent churches um, is very relevant to, to South Africa. And so since the, since the 1960s, the independent churches and the Pentecostal churches have become far more important than these big power players, the Methodists and the Anglicans. Um, I had material I didn't have time to go into that makes it clear that the Methodists and the Anglicans really dominate this Christian council up until the 1960s. And yes. um, I also just reflect a little bit on the creation of the South African Council of Churches and how it differed. And, um, and the South African Council of Churches was certainly a vehicle for powerful confrontation and criticism. Can I just pick up on Bernard's interesting comment about the influence of Cistercians on Gandhi? Is Marion Hill Cistercian or not? Are the Cistercians, I'm just um, not sure. I'm, I'm not sure, all I can say is that- No, but this is Bernard, Bernard, one of the other uh, people here. It isn't any longer. It, it, it was Cistercian, but it's, right. an, it's another congregation now whose name I can't, uh, can't remember, but um, for some reason it changed. Right, right. So you're saying that Marion Hill influenced Gandhi? Uh, very strongly, yes. It, 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 I can't give you the reference, but it, it does appear in his diaries or, or somewhere like that. Right, right. You know, so Marion Hill is this terribly important, influential 
um, Catholic uh, monastery in Natal from which a lot of educational as well as religious influence mm. stems. Mm. Um, I mean, I've not worked on Catholics in detail, but I know Marion Hill was very important. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and I, I don't know, despite having been born in Durban years ago, I left when I was five and I don't really know the geography there. I then became a Cape Tonian. So mm -hmm. I don't even quite know where all these different <laughs> places jostle up against each other. Um, it's, it's not far. It's, it's a sort of... Um... No, it's it, it is within a half an hour at least, at uh, most, at most. Right, right. Half no, I mean, I think I think that <clears throat> sort of comment just points to a very interesting interreligious uh, fertilization and uh, interaction that we underestimate in South Africa. That that these different religious figures know each other and hear each other and. Um, and sometimes maybe even have their their people kind of shopping around between different options. Um, well, I mean, now the the the, the Durban scene is very ecumen ecumenical and uh, uh, multi faith. Um, right. So this is something you know. I'm sorry, I don't know your background, but you are familiar with all this. We just happened to have been there um, in 2014 when I was uh, doing some research in India and uh, I picked this up um, and uh, stayed in Durban uh, at the, um, the Catholic Cathedral. Right. And uh, because it has such strong links with uh, Archbishop Dennis Hurley, who was... Right. Um, you know, the leading Catholic um, anti-apartheid. Yeah. Um, campaigner. Yeah. <clears throat> Fascinating. Interface. And it and it has a um, an so, interfaith. Well, sorry. Did I mention because it has a Muslim? Yes, it has a very strong interfaith uh, connection now. Um, the Dennis Hurley Center, for instance, is a, a a hub of a lot of work with um, with people from all over Africa who are. Um, have problems of one sort or another, refugees. employment, refugees. homelessness, refugees, um, asylum seekers, etc. So it's a kind of social justice centre. Yes. Mm. yes. Right. Right. Well, the early centre. Right. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> th th this is uh, all uh, fascinating insight, and then of course, uh, you know. Jesse, Jesse Mugambi, what you said is uh, very much, um, it's uh, um, a component which is, uh, if you do historical research, then you often rely on, uh, uh, on sources which are printed by the, or written by the members of the elite, quite simply because they have been educated or they have um, uh, access to printing presses and this is what we then read. And uh, it's very important to listen to oral accounts because otherwise it's, um, um, th that becomes uh, forgotten. So um, uh, your, your comment in the end that you were blessed because you, you can remember and you can uh, make these uh, statements is important because they, that, that, that will mean that um, uh, it becomes part of the living memory. Um, sorry, that the living memory becomes part of history. And this is important that we teach that. Um, yes. Um, other questions also by those, I'm aware that some are actually at work or are in the, in the background and they can't raise their voices, but you can type in your, your messages um, into the function, like um, Joe had to leave us. Um, uh, anybody else? No, then I um, would like to um, just announce the, um, the, the short list of um, uh, the next few presentations that will come in uh, uh, later in the autumn, in November and in December. We will have Evangelo Siani, uh, who will talk on the Mau Mau, um, and then uh, Alexander Dimitrenko will talk about the Chinese 
the Orthodox Russian missions to, to China. Um, we have one presentation by uh, Christopher Hancock, who's uh, a former bishop who, who uh, will uh, give us his, um, introduce his uh, book, his comparative work between Confucianism and uh, Christianity. Uh, of course, he's uh, himself established in Oxford and he has a, um, a center, Oxford House, which, uh, which deals very much with the same remit as ours, namely the um, world Christianity, different uh, Christian movements in various parts of the world. Um, and David Salter, then probably just before Christmas, will give us a, um, uh, uh, an introduction to the, uh, his work amongst the uh, Copts of Luxor, and uh, so in uh, Egypt. Um, then in January, we have Alison uh, Ruth Kolosova, uh, uh, who will talk about her own uh, research, again focused on the um, on the uh, Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox missions, and then finally in uh, 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 late January we'll have uh, Daniela uh, Dumbrava, who will talk about her recent research on Lebanon. And as a final, uh, not final, but an additional speaker, we will have Erica Hunter. Uh, All right, leader, yes. Um, it's just that to get a date for, for, for this is, is a little bit difficult, but it will be at some point in the uh, autumn or in the, uh, in the winter, so we will see. Um, and um, you, you will get a list as soon as I have, uh, as I can pin down dates, because that <laughs> is the problem <laughs> um, with the speakers, but, but we have um, a relative, we, I got them all to agree to the um, Wednesday lunchtime um, uh, slot. And um, so this will come imminently uh, as soon as I have the last few details. So thank you very much, dear Debbie, and um, um, uh, thank you for um, tuning in and for being with us in these um, uh, for, for, for these um, um, almost two hours now. So this I'm, I'm actually no one and a half hours. So this was actually a very um, fruitful uh, uh, talk and very interesting, and also the feedback was. Uh, 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 phenomenal. Thank you very much. And Thank I look you very much. To yes. Apologies for the late start. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. for helping me get sorted. Yes. Thanks a Thank lot. You. I enjoyed it. Thank you for all of to all of you for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.